Uh, yes, hello and welcome to another edition of Triple M Footy's Midweek Rub. Can you believe it? Round 22 coming up this weekend already, but the boys are here. They're all in good form. They're all looking sharp and they're all up and about as I look to my left and welcome Daisy Thomas. Good afternoon, Daisy. Good afternoon, Joey. Great to be here again. Plenty happening in the world of footy, which is exciting and getting to the pointy end of the season, which we love. Damo, welcome to you. There's always plenty happening. We haven't got time for welcomes, Joey. <laughs> Straight into it. Straight into it. Oh. We, 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 uh, we often like a little bit of banter off the top, don't we? Oh, but is this serious Not today. today. No. I bring Hello, too much. The man I'm, you're about to Hello, introduce Duck. has Whatever. been on the phone all morning. I've hardly had a word into him. He wants to get a few things for, off his no, chest, I, I think. For, what, week for, for, you, whatever reason, for whatever reason, I don't even have to bring you guys current material. <laughs> I can bring you material from 20 years ago that actually uh, – is big news. Don't Duck, you know, let, let's treat it seriously because you were the focus yeah. of uh, an event, oh. the 1996 North Melbourne Premiership Reunion Great held couple of days. at Yarraville Pub on yep. Saturday, reported on Monday that you had uh, an blows. altercation. Well, Said, one, of the, no, one, one of the, one of the, uh, what's his name? Who, who broke the story? It was Sam Edmund. On, Sam Edmund. On uh, so the, so the, the a, a first very good story, journalist. Though. The first story, yeah, well, no, not really, because the first story said came to blows. Now, that's factually incorrect, so there were no blows. There was a firm conversation. Altercation, I think, is even too firm to say that, um, that that occurred. Firm conversation. What he left out of the what he left out of the story, I think everyone knows that Steve-O and I aren't best mates. That's not a puzzle. So why this keeps coming up, I don't know. What he did leave out was that at the end of the night or the evening or late afternoon, whatever it was, Steve-O and I actually had a couple of beers together and left together. So we were standing out the front, both waiting for our respective Ubers to leave the particular venue. So he left that out. So it sounds like we've had this massive blow up and an altercation and as he said, come to blows, which clearly was uh, factually incorrect. So we leave together. So he leaves that out. He also leaves out the fact that now, I don't know whether Steve-O was upset uh, the next day or not, and that's why he didn't come to the motorcade. What I do know that Steve-O... And, and the motorcade being that the pre-North Melbourne Adelaide match where the, the players from the 96 game so what, were celebrated at Marvel Stadium. Correct. And what I and, do... And you attended that. Yes. And what I do know about that, my understanding, and I've spoken to Arch and I've spoken to uh, Kingy and I've spoken to heaps of other players that are, are close with Steve-O as well as um, some of those players I'm close with. And they, Steve-O wasn't well. He'd had a reasonable night, be fair to say. We all had a reasonable day. Steve may be bigger than others. So he didn't he didn't attend the Sunday. The other thing that if if there was a big issue and this big thing that had happened and it had upset all of these ex, you know, teammates of mine and everyone else, on the Sunday, I sat there with Darren Crocker, I sat there with Danielle Laidley, I sat there with Glenn Archer, I sat there with Sholey, all mutual, some of them really mutual friends of both of ours. If I'd upset the apple cart or, or they were really disappointed with what had occurred on that day, then I, that next day would not be happening. So it's been blown into something that it absolutely wasn't. Um, and, and that's disappointing. And what, it's not disappointing for me. This is what, this is what really hurts every single time. So when Dills, Dills like Sam over-exaggerate something that's happened, who it affects, what he doesn't realise, it affects Steve-O's daughters. It affects my daughters and my, not my son, because he's only young and, and, but it affects them, family members and everyone else. That's what these types of things do. Who cares if Steve-O and I had a, had a firm conversation together? Who, like, how is that, it's, how is that an actual story? Are you able to clear up what it was? What is did, an actual what story? What you did say now that it has been made public? I uh, mean, and, and if it doesn't benefit I, what you're to, alluding no, to, to, be honest, to? No, no, no. Well, I, I wanted to have a conversation about Steve-O about, I was, I'm, I was worried about him and I said, I'm worried about you. And he said, well, he obviously took a, a little bit of umbrage to me saying I was worried about him. He probably, um, Thought maybe the word contributed. Maybe the word. Well, of course. Yeah. But I'd, I'd said I'm, I'm worried about. You know, I want him to look after himself, just like people want me to look after myself. Now he took a little bit of umbrage to that, but to say that it was a massive altercation or came to blows, and and then we we left there and everyone was upset with everyone and it was a big thing is totally incorrect. So that's the disappointing part about it. So it's not a story. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a story. And it still isn't a story. And I hope I've just cleared up that once again, this has been blown into something that it absolutely wasn't. Is it fair that players can have a private matter that could stay private? Or do you think do you think it's fair, the reporting on the, that story? Oh, well, again, I hadn't heard. I mean, I, I 
it's fair to say we would spoken, didn't we? After yeah. the story was reported. So uh, as always, Joey, there's versions of events flying around and, and the truth's somewhere in the middle. We've now got Duck's version. And I'm comfortable with what Duck has said there, absolutely. I mean, the, we know the history of the the situation. We know that it is always going to be talked about. Um, Duck's I'm not version. sure why it, why it yeah. should always mm. be talked about. I, I get mm. what you're saying, Duck. <laughs> you're right. It doesn't make sense. No. But 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 there was a reunion and, and obviously yeah. something happened and look some people argue and Sam I'm I'm not here to defend Sam as I've said he's a very good journalist Dark you've you've said that what he reported well he's let himself down well on that this. and that's your version of that yeah. and and that's that's fair enough for you too you know so, what Sam you know what Sam we all have bad days you've had a shocker we'll leave it at that we'll take our first break because Damo there's plenty of other news there newsworthy is, stories coming up to chat about after this we'll do the Daisy Duck Dive and we'll also take a look at all the round twenty two action because there is. Plenty on the line for a lot of teams in regards to making finals and finishing top four. That's all still to come on Triple M Footy's Midweek Rub. Welcome back to Triple M Footy's Midweek Rub. And now that we've got that off our chest, we can get into Damo. Some of the footy news happening around the industry this week. Yeah, footy news. What are the footy news? Real <laughs> footy news. <laughs> Real stories. Yeah. The, the Blues, obviously, given their uh, four and six scoreline from the past 10 matches days. And obviously, and as we speak, there's no um, confirmation whether they'll appeal the tribunal finding last night, which confirmed the match review office decision on Paddy Cripps's hit on Kalamachi being worthy of two weeks. Out for the game against Melbourne out for the game against Collingwood as we speak. Either way, uh, they've got to win one of those two games to be assured of a finals berth, and it's gone haywire. It certainly has. It's yeah, it's really disappointing in the sense of how it's happening. And yes, there are excuses and reasons. I, you know I'm a big one for that. Some of the reasons being personnel and injuries coming at the wrong time. But I crunched some of the numbers just on their forms round 1 to 10 and where they were in the big key stats. So contested ball, they're still really strong, still ranked second. But then it starts to fall away. Clearances were ranked second, now eighth. Centre clearances were number one. So think of the personnel they've had in there and the changes now that will come. They're currently ranked 14th in wow. that situation. You go to inside 50s, were fifth, now 12th. Scores uh, are down about three goals between rounds one to 10 and, and beyond. Well, that's and then it. Beyond. Go- goals yeah. per inside 50. So that talks more to your ball movement and how you're getting it in. Are you getting it in before defences can fold back? They were sixth, now 18th. Worst in the comp for goals per inside 50 and points. Gone from 93.2, which was fifth, to 77, which is 14th. So there are concerns. That's the centre of the ground. That's forward mm. of centre. And obviously giving up big scores at the other end. So it has really turned... Half glass full, they are still capable of winning one of these last two games. That is the upside, and then you can sort things out and try and rectify a few of these issues going into finals, but it's going to be bloody hard can, without Paddy Cripps. Can they, get a, can they get on a run? You're right, so Cripps is going to be out. Can they get on a run, Joey, and do what, say, the Bulldogs did in 16? Are they, do they have that sort of talent and that capability? I, I think they do. Why not? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be tough for them to make mm. the finals, but then if they get... Cripps comes back and Kennedy will be back. We're not sure about Georgie Hewitt. We're hearing bad things yeah, about Georgie like Hewitt. Like he's he's been a big over. cog that's been out. He has. Yeah. He's been an important, really yeah. important cog. Highly unlikely yeah. to return this year. But they yeah. get their personnel back behind the ball. The Pitnet, the interesting discussion, Pitnet to Coning. We had that a couple of weeks ago. They've still got the same forward line that's there. Mm. They could turn it around. They, they can. I mean, the numbers you spoke about, Dave, you've got to remember, that, that was a really high benchmark the first 10 yes. weeks. I mean, that was a hard level to, to stay at for how well they were playing. They've, they've come back down to earth. Uh, I agree. I think a little bit the latter position's played a little bit. I think they've gone conservative with the way they've moved the ball. All of a sudden, Damo, you go from having a new coach mm, and just playing yeah. duck carefree yep, footy. Yep. Then all of a sudden, oh, we're sitting fourth. And, oh, there's a weight of expectation. There is. And all of a sudden you in. play not to lose rather than playing to win. And Fremantle went through it as well. So I think they can find if they just release the shackles a little yeah, bit yeah. and play a bit more yeah. on instinct and try and, go out and win a game rather than just trying and not lose. Well, I think they have to. You just look at Collingwood and see what they're That's doing. Exactly right. That's Spot exactly on. what they've got to look at and just say, let's just play like that. Let's just take the game on, get our contested stuff right, and then just just go for it. Would yep. love to see them review that game on the weekend of the half a quarter that they played really well and were dominant and go, look, why can't we do this? Why don't we play with that expansive ball movement and take them on? We're, obviously, what you're doing and when you play safe, you almost die a slow death. You give yeah. sides a chance to fold back those numbers I speak of. That's because oppositions are getting back in front of you. Harry Mackay's who's out of form. Charlie Kerno not having the impact. Get it in long and strong to these boys. You can see what they do in those first 10 rounds. So I think they can turn it around. I'm still half full, although 
alert but not alarmed just yet. I'm still with you. And even if they don't make finals, Damo, for me, I still think this has been a huge successful year for them. See, I don't, I don't subscribe know, to that yeah, now. Absolutely. From yeah. where we were thinking about them at start, I think this is a nah, huge nah. stepping stone for their future. We really Joey, we at probably don't two, think they were going to win the flag. At 8 and 2, I reset, and, and I had higher expectations from that You've got point. to take the bigger picture into it for the whole season. Mm. I think this is a huge stepping stone for their next three or four years when really is their chance to contend for a flag. I, I, think it's I, a huge, I hear what you're saying huge there. I think it would be a massively lost opportunity. Yeah. I, I agree with you, Damo. From eight and two at the start of the season, I think we most of us had it probably six to twelfth, and that was a fair enough uh, spot to have them. Uh, if you start eight and two, the expectation shouldn't be that if we miss finals, it's a successful year. Mm. The expectation then should shift to if we yep. miss finals, we've let ourselves yeah, I, down. I agree with that. Yeah, bigger picture, I think that they'll, this will hold them in good stead no matter what. Of course, they want to play a final and even win a final or two, but I think that this is a great stepping foundation for them to build to a premiership team over the next three to five years. Hey, uh, we spoke about one Josh Kennedy last week retiring, the great West Coast Eagle. Now, another great Josh Kennedy is stepping away. Yeah, similar storylines, weren't they? Yeah, similar time in the game. Obviously, uh, their damage and impact at AFL was done at a second footy club. Um, obviously, for, for the, the Swans version, having started at Hawthorne, where his famous name was already entrenched at the club. And to think he's uh, been able to do what he's done, win a premiership at the Sydney Swans um, against Hawthorne, obviously in in the way that one unfolded and so here we are, 2022. Now, he's retired at the end of the year. He's uh, got that little 1% hope that his hamstring will get him back. It, it, it's not going to happen, though, mm. is it? So the fairy tale is not going to be there. But as he said yesterday, Duck, it doesn't matter. It, what, what, his, his career is already encapsulated with uh, with brilliance. He's been a super player, and we've mentioned it a few times. Great finals player, 2016. He was easily the Swans' Best player, BOG at half time, uh, just been just been a workhorse. Three goals in that losing yeah, grand final he's, and, and he's, nearly won it for them. Yeah, unbelievable career. Yeah. And and one that you can't believe. You think about sliding doors, the fact that a Hawthorne let him go to go to Sydney and then uh, the career he's had, incredible. Couldn't get a game regularly anyway, but in, in seasons 2007, 8 and 9, his first and only three years at, at Hawthorne. And, and obviously they won a flag in 08. You guys would have come across him in those early days, would have come across him as a, he as a was swan. He was impossible to stop at the peak of his powers as a midfielder. He was, I think, one of the first real big-bodied mids that we yeah. now mm. lord with Cripps and Petrarca and Fife and all these big-bodied mids. He You're was right the about real yeah. first one of them that we almost got. He was impossible to stop at a stoppage. He had he? ridiculous strength. The strength. You could tackle him. I yeah. could I could have hung off him and basically piggybacked him. He still would have got the handball out. Oh, yeah. I remember playing centre bounces against him and trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> do you take the side and run into him and I'd bounce off him or I'd take the back and he just hold me there, I'd take the front and he'd put me out to the wing. So he was a mm. phenomenal player. And that final stuff you speak of, mm. he's someone, as a Sydney fan, you would have loved to have gone and watch. But just as a footy fan, you knew what you are going to get every time you flicked on a final series. And he was playing hard, tough, encapsulated what the Swans and Bloods culture was. Three BNFs, three All-Australians, yeah. four times best finals player for the Sydney Swans. I remember and a stage at St Kilda, we actually double teamed at stoppages. We wedged him. We basically had one player yeah. either side of him to try and limit his influence at stoppage. He's been one of the all-time great Swans. And and, and three times uh, in the top six or seven of the Brownlow yeah. count too and, and started favourite or thereabouts on a few occasions. Who's going to win that this year now that Cripps has had his form taper off a little bit and obviously officially, as we speak, suspended, therefore can't win. There's still five biggish names or big names in that bookmakers charts. Uh, Days, Joey, Duck, um, obviously led by Lockie Neal, who's I think fa- or very clear cut favourite now to go uh, second down low. The two Melbourne midfielders, are Oliver and um, and Petrarca. Petrarca. And you've do got, they uh, take Andrew notes Brayshaw. off one another? We know that they and, probably will. And Tuke Miller. Neal, Neal, Brayshaw. They're all the names, all the names we've been talking about all year. I th- Still think they're the ones that are going to be up the top of the tree. Yeah. Who's the smoky boys? Who's your smoky? I think at the minute, I think it's still between the two. So Neil and Brayshaw, I think they'll sort of be yeah, alligator blood cattle Oliver? sort of jewel <laughs> down the straight no, in Oliver. the guineas. Um, no, nah, I think Oliver will be competitive, but I think uh, Petrarca will take votes off them. And then their form has waned throughout the back half of the year. A smoky, I really like Jeremy Cameron. I think mm-hmm. that he's gonna. He's played enough footy. He's kicked enough goals in a side that's won enough games. He might be doing it the harder way in twos, ones, the odd three every now and again. But I think he's a real smoky. And Andy Brayshaw for me is still the one. When you think about Fremantle, they've won thirteen and a half games. Who else is going to take votes? He could do an Ollie Wines and basically poll threes in every game they win yep. because they look at the stat sheet pretty even. And then Andy Brayshaw had his thirty. 
Yeah. Or he might get missed by the umpires because Early he hasn't been, a, yeah. hasn't been a pole getter. So he's the watch for me, but you've got your smoke. Your boy, oh, you're oh, in love with him. I am you in love with Chad Warner. I've, I've declared the him charge. a Brownlow Millers in the future. <laughs> why couldn't it be this year? Why, why couldn't he? If they uh, are awake up to him early, Duck, with what he did early in the season. I mean, he, he played well in Buddy's thousandth goal game back in round two, his first for the year. If they picked him up then, why couldn't he have six or seven BOGs to this point? Because I'm just not sure... We know that a couple of players have done it in, in, in the past, but not too many in their breakout year. We don't know whether he's a pole getter for starters, do yeah, we? Yeah, we don't. So he, He's on the coaches' votes. He, he's yeah, in no, top he's, 10. He's top 10 in the coaches' the, votes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. The no. way he plays, too, would be taking the attention of the umpires. Also has the little rinse through the hair, which also helps. Yeah. Yeah. But he is that burst away from stoppage, and yeah. we saw on the weekend, damaging in front of goal as well. So I think he'll certainly be voting. Just having a quick a look. Polling. He could have eight best on grounds, oh, potentially. He could have eight. If he gets all the threes in games, he could have 24 votes, two games to come. If it's it could a low be coming scoring like a charge. Year, day, and, and the coaches have noticed It will be a low-scoring vote count. Yeah, It won't be the big highs of 30-plus like maybe last year. I like the fact the coaches have uh, discovered him, Duck. It's, yeah, uh, it's good. It's good. <laughs> Just lastly, how good's the game, by the way? How good of a yeah. state is the game in at the moment? We have got so many good games of footy, momentum swings, teams coming from behind, um, great scoring, key forwards back in vogue, Duck. It, it's been a tick to the AFL. For, it's taken maybe a year or two to get these rule changes to show the real effects, but we're loving the footy we've seen this year. It, no one's talking about rolling balls anymore. It always comes off the back of, though, a team that wins the premiership the year before and the way they go about it. So Melbourne, we know that the way they play, they're not playing the same way uh, right at the minute, but so they move the ball, they get it in quickly and, you know, you, you, you get numbers around the footy, front and square, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and other teams have followed suit. I yep. mean, Geelong, Geelong are the, the greatest example in Collingwood, I think. I mean, Geelong have been a, a, a very, very good team for a, a very long time, but just that little tweak that they've made have, has made them now the premiership favourites. Collingwood have gone from nowhere to, you know, the top four just because they're now taking the game away and and that not that stagnant, slow ball movement that we all absolutely hate. Not sure how that ever came in, to be honest with you. Well, Hawthorne used to have such good kicks, all left-footers, used the ball so well so they could do that. Yep. And Geelong obviously had a great control as well, but didn't didn't stand up in finals. So I yeah, for that reason I I love it. I think the stand stand uh, on the mark, although it can be awkward at times, I think that's made a huge difference. Joe, you, you study the game I, I think in more depth than anyone I know and work with. When when you see what's happened, the, the six 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 is crucial. That that rule isn't after the stoppages, and, and I'm a big advocate for the the stand rule. Now I know it's had its detractors, but the fact that the player who's got the ball can take off the forty five degree angle kick because of this rule, I, I think that's equally crucial. One hundred percent, Damo. Anyone that's still a detractor of the stand rule hasn't understood really the depths of it, how the game has opened up because of it. Now kicking is becoming king again. Kicking and kicking forward. And penetrating, you don't have to kick it long and blast away, but you're seeing all these teams go forward more because of the ability to do that. And the ball movement from one end to the other has improved significantly. Um, the rates have gone up. It's made a big difference. And the 666 yeah. rule as well has just stopped teams flooding and getting numbers behind the ball, which has allowed teams to come back from behind yeah. um, and hit the front. So I think it's been excellent. Absolutely. The overlap run too on the back of that stand That's rule, right. waiting for the man to get past so he can release the ball low and flat. You look at the round that was, five teams kicked over 100 points in the wins. Uh, 96, 96 and 95 were the next three. The yeah. lowest score mm -hmm. of the round in a winning team was Hawthorne with 70. That's bloody exciting. That, That's good and, for and footy. 15, 16 years ago, we're having grand finals decided with, with points less than that. As, 70. It's a total, yeah. yeah. As much as that in the pocket handball that you talk about that allows them to get past, I think you, you're spot on with that low, hard kick now that they that's, can just. That's the next one. They, they, they're, they're off the mark. The umpire doesn't call them back and they can just hit anything they want. Yep. Game's in great shape and there's still a massive finals to come. Hey, we'll look ahead to that a bit later on. But up next, we're going to have a look at the Daisy Duck Dive Quick Five. Talking about those final couple of spots in the top eight, we spoke about Carlton in the previous break. It's down to Richmond, the Bulldogs, St Kilda, and the Blues. Daisy, which team will be the biggest disappointment if they miss out on the finals out of out of that quartet? Because you predicted the Western Bulldogs to miss the eight at the start of the season, so credit to you, the Oracle. So are they still the biggest disappointment or is there another team that's that'll disappoint the most? There'll be a lot of noise about them being the bis biggest disappointment just from where they've come from purely because they made a grand final last year. Arguably for me, it'll be the Blues and not from the start of the season, purely because where they had themselves situated at the halfway point, when they got to round 10, eight and two to start the year, that is at worst, you're making top eight. At best, you've got aspirations for top four and you've set it up. You've done the hard work and then you got a chance to reset, go again. We've spoken a little bit about why, but also... 
they should have won a few more games than they have. But what about St Kilda then? They were eight and three, and there was more expectation on them probably this season in their with regards to their window where they're at that they should be playing finals. I'm pretty sure at the start of the year I didn't have them in either. Look, oh, again. There was that bracket we spoke so much about in the early rounds mm. from rounds uh, from spot six on the ladder to 12 and how congested that was going to be. It's played out, but I don't think St Kilda missing is a great shock to too many in the footy world. Because of their starts, the Blues and St Kilda, well, that's disappointing from, from that point on. So they got off to great starts. But the Bulldogs easily for me, they were one kick away from winning that grand final. They go one, one more in front and we're talking about them as premiers, I reckon. And now we know what happened and Melbourne smashed them, but... That that's why where they sit right now, I think they're the biggest fall. What about over in Port Adelaide and Dame? I get your opinion. A lot of talk on Ken Hinckley's future. Do you guys think that Port Adelaide should stick with Ken Hinckley for one more year and go to the well again with this group that have been pretty good for Ken? Yes, they've had disappointing this year. Or yep. have you seen other teams like a Collingwood and yeah. think and, and Carlton and think a new first year coach might give them the spike with this group that they've got? To give them a crack. It's such a complex situation, Joey, isn't it? I, yeah. I've had the view now for some weeks that I still feel we'll get to the end of the year and Ken and David Kosh and others at Port will have the conversation and he won't be there. That, that's just my opinion on that. I don't know what to make of the public commentary by David Kosh yesterday. I don't know whether it changes it dramatically or it's just part of the part of the theatre. And there is a theatre attached. What I will say, though, is when you've got a good coach, to willingly choose to remove him, it's – often the most dangerous thing a club can do, no matter where you think you are and no matter what you think that coach has done with his list. Recent example, North Melbourne, Brad Scott, 2019. Now, you can factor all that in. He might have taken them as far as they could have got, but the moment they removed him and brought others in, it just didn't work. What about at Hawthorne? They they removed the greatest coach of the modern era, and I think they'd be saying right now they're pretty comfortable with their decision. They'd be very comfortable with that decision. And and to your better and stronger point, Collingwood with with Nathan Buckley Mm. too. But yeah, so I I don't think Ken will be there next year. I just think one year is a little bit of a slap in the face. I mean, if Ken's to do it, he probably wants, because let's be honest, if if he puts his hand up and says, and they come to a mutual decision and he says, leave, he gets a job for three, four years, doesn't he? At another club. At another club. Probably. He probably gets a three or four year deal. So it's whether he wants to back himself in, if they're prepared to give him one. I'd be giving him one. And well, he's then, still got one to go. So just oh, let still it got, play okay, out. So let, got one to go. Okay, so let that yeah. play out. Yeah. So you let that play out and you say, okay, I'm going to back myself in. And then if he if he does what I think this list can do, then all of a sudden then he gets the, the three years on top of that. Hey, I'm big on that one as well. Let the yep. year play out. I think he hasn't lost the group. And I think that's the biggest thing. When I look at coaches and when you're talking about how they're playing and how their team's playing, you can see if they still have the group from what the noise you hear externally, from how they present. When everyone speaks about Ken, it's with genuine love and affection and they really want him to be there. They think he's the number one man and that's not made up. That's not quasi or or false or fluffy. And after their start, to go, what have they gone, eight and seven? Well, they've only gone eight and seven after mm. the zero five start. But that's not a bad well, turnaround considering you started yeah. zero and five. Yeah. So but, they've but found something. It's not compelling enough to, to, to say it's working. But if you know, if they finish the year uh, with a couple of wins or one more win, get it to 10 and seven, yeah. there's that little bit of a springboard we yeah. talk about and they can turn around pretty quickly. big quick. decision. What, what's I, your take? I, my take, I think he deserves one more year. And yeah. I think he's a good enough coach that maybe he can do a bit of a Chris Scott and go, okay, how can we change up the way that we play to be a real threat again? I think he deserves that right. Let the year play out and then make the call, you know, as Duck said, he either they extend him and he goes on and they're back up or then they do look and, to get a new And coach. he hasn't had a Ruckman all year effectively, yeah. has he? Really? And they've got yeah. Essendon and Adelaide to come, both very win- yeah. winnable games. Uh, the talk today about Brody Grundy potentially going to Melbourne. What are your thoughts on that? Do Melbourne, for one, need Brody Grundy? Is that the right option if they do lose Luke Jackson? Oh, I think if they lose Jackson, they just want that extra Ruckman uh, there. How do they split the time between Gorn and Grundy? What does that look like? Does that help I think Melbourne it'd be similar. I think it would be similar to what uh, he and Jackson does, wouldn't it? Isn't that, that what they'd be trying to replicate? Yeah. That's what I would have thought. Yeah, I'm confused by that one. Not for the fact that obviously like for like almost Jackson goes out, they're trying to replace it. But I think Jackson's got more tricks up forward than Brody Grundy does. We haven't really well, seen him. He hasn't exactly t- uh, you know, taken a heap of marks and kicked goals. Yeah, but in terms of he's only still in his infancy of a footballing so, career. So you go to Brody Grundy, we haven't seen that over a long period of time. So the upside to put him as a forward, you probably can prove the case that it's Hasn't happened. It's been three years, hasn't it? Now, so the two the two COVID affected years, Grundy he had, yep. you know, yep. quiet. Years. Yes, he did. Yep. And then this C- year, coming off, so coming two off all Australians, injuries. yeah, coming Before off to all Australians, yeah. correct. So it's yeah. been three. You're right. It's been three years mm. since we've seen Brody's best. So there is some risk attached to it. 
clearly. I'd be chasing a big forward. If you've got, what, it's going to be seven, 800000 to go and spend on someone, I'd be luring anyone you could who is a big key forward. That's what I think. That's what I think that Melbourne need most. I don't need midfielders. Their back line's steady as ever when they're all out there. Speaking of key forwards, last question, duck dive. Rory Lobb has been linked to the Western Bulldogs. We've spoken to them about their disappointing year. Is that going to actually help the Western Bulldogs or do they need to have a big, deeper look at the way they play as a team, their defensive systems, and maybe because of what we spoke about earlier with the ball movement and the way teams have adjusted, they need to more look at the system of their team defense or is it just personnel and bringing in Lobb and Jones will be the answer? I'm a fan of Lobb. I think he makes any team better. Um, when he's on, he can mark the footy, he can kick a goal, he can go into the ruck. So uh, he makes anyone better for me. As a Bulldogs fan, do you sit there and go, geez, he's a very good forward. He kicked five goals or wow, our back line absolutely stinks. How easy was it? Like it's a little bit of that. I'm not sure where I land on that one. Probably in the case that I don't think he's the answer. I think they need a defender more than they need a key forward. They've got Shaki who's playing reserves footy and kicking goals at the moment. Jamara Eugle Hagen that's had his best month of footy for a long time. And then also the astronaut up there. I'm not sure. And, and I know... There's been talk that maybe you put Aaron Norton to send half back and trial him there, which, again, no real reason to do that unless you then go and chase another forward to push him out of his number one spot. Confuses me that, but obviously they've got more rhyme and reason to it than what I can come up with. As can be the case too, Joey, when there's an absence of a player for some time, they become better than they were when they were last in the game. Mm. Liam Jones has become Alex Rance in the yeah, time that, away yeah. from the game, hasn't he? Yeah, that's it's right. A, I was stuck about those things. Yeah, you're right. He's, he hasn't played for 12 months. and He's, he's, he's 30, been playing how up. How old he be? 32. He's been playing up at South. Oh, How's McGovern yeah. been going? <laughs> oh. It's been all right. He's okay. He'll have a big role to play coming up for the no, finals. I just remember, wasn't that all that long ago, we had uh, Rance, uh, Steve Silvani crossed into Langford <laughs> coming back. Week, Rub, we're going to keep rolling because Duck's keen to get out of here and get to dinner. Hey, um, let's, <laughs> uh, well, we're on radio, yeah. so I say... Don't, don't start that. I'll be doing something. I'll <laughs> say that. We'll go lunch first, then kicks in the dinner. <laughs> hey, uh, before we have a look at the round 22 games, we just always uh, like to hold ourselves accountable. Melbourne Collingwood was always a tough one for us to tip. Let's just take a listen back to how we tip these games. Melbourne v Collingwood. Oh. Can the pies keep doing it, Duck? The bubble to burst. The bubble to burst this week. Yep. Has to burst at some stage, I think. <laughs> well, you'd have to. You can't keep winning games by less than a kick. <laughs> oh, yes, you can. <laughs> oh, yes, you can. The bubble still ain't burst. Oh, very good. Unfortunately for Pies fans, I think also, I think it'll be a good game, but I will be tipping the Ds, although I could see the Pies winning, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's a draw. <laughs> is, is that enough pause in between? Jill, so you can cut that up. Good, yeah. good stuff. And I keep copying criticism for underestimating Collingwood and not tipping them, so I think the Pies will win. Oh, oh do you? Yeah. Do you actually, wow. or is that just you trying to please the people? I think the Pies will win. There you good go. Call, Joey. Well done, well done, Joey. Well done, Joey and Daisy. Out of the four of us. The bubble ain't burst Two just yet. Uh, it's still rolling. <laughs> oh. <laughs> sort of. I had a, each way all up for the first four. Hey, let's get into this yeah, week's games. Uh, a lot to play for, particularly for St Kilda. They need to win one of their last two games to make finals. They've got Brisbane at Marvel Stadium Friday night. Can anyone see them upsetting Brisbane? Apparently St Kilda have uh, put that to the AFL. They want that move to MCG. <laughs> yeah, very oh, clever, Dale. No, day. I can't. Clever. I think Brisbane will be winning. Yeah, I can't tip St Kilda. No. Unfortunately, I can't either. Brisbane, yeah, they're looking pretty sharp now. Zach Bailey back in a bit of form. Daisy, what a your boy. What a he player. might be the one, the X Factor come finals time. Hey, uh, what about the Melbourne Carlton game? Saturday night. This is massive. We've spoken earlier about the Blues needing to win a game as well to guarantee themselves finals. Can anyone see them beating Melbourne without Cripps, Kennedy, and Hewitt? No. No, for that for that reason. The midfield has just been smashed and there's no obvious replacement. Oracle? Also no. Oh. I thought you were going to give the Blues a chance. I give them a chance. I just hope they come out and play with some real freedom. We've seen that you can expose Melbourne a little bit in that manner if you take them on by ball, but I think they'll get beat up in the midfield. I know you're big on that as well. So it'll be too hard, too much ball going into the Melbourne forward line, which means you have to transition at the full length of the ground, which is hard to do at any ground, let alone the MCG against the Ds. Couldn't have said it any better myself. The last one, we'll take a look at Sydney Collingwood at the SCG on Sunday. This is a massive It's an old-fashioned sellout, this one. Yeah, Yeah, it's a beauty. Sydney at home. Oh, bubble burst. Bubble going to burst this week? They can't win again by under 10 points, can they? Collingwood (laughs) Collingwood supporters are loving 
what I'm TV, yeah. how I'm TV. Yeah, that's right. So bubble to burst this week. Joey, in a week where I finally came around to realising Collingwood is a premiership hype, I'm still going to tip against them. Swans. You've been, <laughs> so you've been on the Swans all year, so stick yeah, with them. I've got to stick with him. I yeah. went against the Pies last week and the feedback was very strong, so I'm back on board. Go the Pies. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. The feedback's oh. on. I, was, I underestimated them for about the first 16 <laughs> rounds. Yeah. Now I'm just going to keep tipping them until the bubble does burst. I think Collingwood will win this one by under 10 points again. Again. You watch this wave continue. Uh, and then lastly, just quickly touch on Essendon and Port Adelaide. You spoke earlier, Daisy, about Port Adelaide. Bombers, they are disappointing against the Giants, but they've had a really good six or eight weeks. Anyone see this one? Anyone got interest? Ducks, no. Nah, Ducks no, Ducks keen to get out of here. Well, well, well they're not playing finals. Either, no, they're not. The Bombers will win that one, I think. Yeah. Hey, good, uh, good at show. You, Thank Duck. you, Duck. Well right. done See to you, Duck. you, mate. Get out of here. Go and enjoy it. Relax. And have a beer. This has been Triple M Footy's <laughs> Midweek Rub, exclusive to the listener app. And, of course, you can listen to every game this weekend live on Triple M and the listener app, starting with Friday night's clash between St Kilda and Brisbane with the Friday huddle. Das, Howie, Brownie, Damo and Chief are all going to be there. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll do it all again next Wednesday.